Molecular and Ionic Compounds In ordinary chemical reactions, the nucleus of each atom remains unchanged. So this is one of Dalton's postulates, that um, in a chemical reaction, the atoms aren't created or destroyed, and they're not even changed, they just trade partners. So uh, bonds are broken between certain atoms and formed between other atoms. Uh, electrons participate in chemical reactions by being gained, lost, or shared. The gain or loss of electrons results in the formation of ions. So on the left is a sodium atom that has 11 protons and 11 electrons. And on the right is a sodium ion that has 11 protons and 10 electrons. So when um, it, an electron is positively charged and excuse me, an electron is negatively charged and a proton is positively charged and when they're equal then they cancel out and there's no charge on the atom. So when there's 11 protons and 11 electrons then the atom is neutral. When there's 11 protons and 10 electrons then that gives the atom a positive charge because there's more protons than electrons. Um, and you can also see that the sodium ion on the right is smaller than the sodium atom because the electrons are orbiting the nucleus. The electrons are represented by that purple cloud. So if there's fewer electrons, then the cloud gets smaller. An ionic bond is formed between ions of opposite charge. So just like magnets, um, a positive and a negative charge are attracted to each other. And two positive charges will repel, and two negative charges will repel. Um, also just like magnets. So um, we can see in the first picture here there's a sodium atom and a chlorine atom. A uh, sodium atom has one electron in its valence shell, that's just its outermost shell of electrons, and the chlorine atom has seven electrons in its valence shell. So um, there's a magic number in chemistry uh, that all atoms are trying to get to, which is eight. They all want to get eight electrons in their outer shell. So when sodium gives its one electron to chlorine, then chlorine gets eight electrons. You can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And although sodium gives up its one electron, so it looks like it has zero electrons, it actually has a full shell of electrons underneath. So when this transfer occurs and sodium gives its electron to chlorine, that gives chlorine a full shell of electrons with eight, and it also gives sodium a full shell of electrons underneath. So it also has eight electrons underneath that one that it just lost. So that also gives chlorine a negative charge because it gains one extra electron and electrons are negative. And it gives sodium a positive charge because sodium is losing a negative electron, which uh, leaves behind a positive charge. So when that happens, when this electron transfer occurs, if a sodium atom and a chlorine atom get close to each other, this happens spontaneously. The electron wants to go over here. Then these two ions are formed. And once these two ions are formed, they stick together like magnets. These two atoms on this side aren't particularly attracted to each other because they're both neutral. But once they become plus and minus, they become stuck together. So this is the nature of an ionic bond. Uh, just like magnets, a positive, positively charged particle and a negatively charged particle get stuck together. So remember, if an atom gives up electrons and it becomes positive, it's called a cation. And if an atom steals electrons or it takes electrons and it becomes negative, it's called an anion. The other thing to notice about an ionic bond is that it's formed between a metal and a non-metal. So in this case, the metal is sodium, and a nonmetal is chlorine. Remember, we can tell where the um, metals and the nonmetals are on the periodic table by finding the bold zigzag line that uh, separates the right side. So remember, the nonmetals are on the right side of that line, and the metals are on the left side of that line. So in this case, sodium is a metal, and chlorine is a nonmetal. And ionic bonds are always formed between a metal and a nonmetal. And the metal always becomes the cation, and the nonmetal always becomes the anion.
When electrons are transferred, ions form and an ionic bond results. Ionic bonds are electrostatic forces of attraction. Um, alternatively, when electrons are shared and molecules form, a covalent bond results. So compounds are classified as either ionic or molecular, also called covalent, on the basis of the bonds present in them. So um, here's a diagram that shows um, the difference between elements and compounds and the different kinds of elements and compounds that we have. So remember, um, back in chapter one, we uh, showed a distinction between pure substances and mixtures. And pure substances are those in which all of the particles in those samples are the same. So there are two kinds of pure substances, elements and compounds. And it turns out that there are two kinds of elements and two kinds of compounds. So um, we have atomic elements. These are elements that come one at a time. So for example, the noble gases, they don't make bonds and uh, they're kind of spread out like this. So this might be a representation of a noble gas. Other elements that are atomic elements that come one at a time are metals. But some elements come two at a time, like these oxygen atoms are stuck together. So we know that oxygen doesn't, on Earth anyway, oxygen is not in the form of O. It always comes as O2. There's always two oxygen atoms stuck together. So we have atomic elements, those that come one at a time, one atom separated, and molecular elements, those that are that come two at a time or even more. Um, we also have two different kinds of compounds. There are molecular compounds, and molecular compounds are those that are made from nonmetals. So hydrogen atoms, for example, and oxygen. Hydrogen and oxygen are both nonmetals, so they form molecular compounds. Um, we also have ionic compounds, like over here. Sodium chloride is an example of an ionic compound, and those are formed between a metal and a nonmetal. So um, nonmetal and nonmetal, and metal and nonmetal. So ions are charged particles, and in sodium chloride, sodium has a plus one, and chloride has a minus one. Um, but that's not always the case in all ionic compounds. They always have charges, but the charges can be different. Sometimes the cation has a plus one charge, sometimes it has a plus two charge, um, and so on. They can have different charges in the anions too. So um, it's important for us to be able to determine what the charge is going to be on an ion, on an element, if we can place it in the periodic table. So it turns out that elements in group one form a cation with a plus one charge. Elements in group two form a cation with a plus two charge. Elements in group 17 form an anion uh, with a minus one charge. And in group 16 form an anion with a minus two charge. So we don't necessarily have to memorize what charge is on each of these um, in each of these groups. So I'm moving through this a little bit quickly so that I can get to the picture of the periodic table and we can talk um, in more detail about how to predict the ion charge. But let's take a look at, um, at these pictures here. So uh, these, these are representations of elements number three through number 10. And uh, the little dots that are beside the chemical symbol are representing the valence electrons. So lithium is the first element in the second row and it has one valence electron being the first element. Beryllium is the second element in that row so it has two valence electrons. Boron is the third in that row and it has three and so on. So the position that an element has within a row in the periodic table tells us how many valence electrons that element has. So if we count across that second row, there's eight elements. So that means that um, lithium has one electron and neon has eight. So all elements are trying to achieve a full shell of electrons and a shell can hold eight.
So uh, neon is a noble gas and it has a full shell and all of the noble gases all have a full shell of electrons and they all appear on the end of the periodic table. The last position of each row is the noble gas. So here are some pictures of, of uh, representations of the electrons around noble gases. So the only one that doesn't have eight electrons in its outer shell is helium. And helium only has two electrons in its outer shell because it only has two electrons total. And that first shell, you can see that on all of the noble gases, that first shell only holds two electrons. So it is a full shell. It's not, eight is not necessarily the magic number. The reason that eight uh, is, works for all these others is because it represents a full shell. So um, all elements want to have valence shells that look like a noble gas. So they're all trying to achieve eight electrons in their valence shell. So when we look at the periodic table and we understand the position of each element within a row tells us something about how many electrons it has around it and that each of those atoms is trying to get to that magic number of eight then we can start to make sense of uh, what we're seeing on this table. So all of the elements that are in this first column all have one valence electron. And I, rep I put that up here. There's a um, one here represents the number of valence electrons in each column. So all of the elements in this column have two. We're going to skip the transition elements for a, for a minute. We'll come back to those. All of the, uh, well, at least aluminum in this column has three. Carbon in this column has four. And these down, um, these have four, charge of four also, lead and tin down here that aren't included. Um, these have five valence electrons and they have a charge of minus three. These have six valence electrons, minus two, seven electrons, and minus one. And here, finally, the noble gases have eight valence electrons in their shell, and they don't have a charge at all. And they're in the last position uh, in each row on the periodic table. So we can count across each row and say, here is the first row, one, two. That first row only has two elements. Well, the first shell only holds two electrons. So then we count across the next row, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the next row has eight elements and the next shell of electrons holds eight electrons. The next row has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the next shell of electrons holds eight. So the periodic table is shaped the way it is. It has this organization because that is the number of electrons that each, each shell holds. So um, lithium has a plus one charge because it wants to uh, get a full shell. And the easiest way for it to do that is for it to lose an electron and then it will go backwards and it'll look like helium. It will have two, it'll have a, a full shell underneath. Beryllium needs to lose both of these electrons. It has two electrons and it will lose both of them, one, two, and then it will have a full shell underneath and it will look like helium. Carbon is in this uh, kind of halfway point where carbon could lose four electrons, one, two, three, four, and then it will have a full shell underneath and it will look like helium. Or carbon can gain four electrons, one, two, three, four, and then it will look like neon. So um, carbon can kind of do either. And carbon is a, a very versatile element in that it can make a lot of bonds to a lot of different elements and to itself. And not a lot of other elements can do that. So there's a whole type, a whole branch of chemistry devoted to carbon called organic chemistry because carbon is kind of unique in that, uh, in that sense. So carbon is kind of in the halfway point there. But here, this, um, these elements in this column all have five valence electrons. So now, rather than losing five, they could lose five, one, two, three, four, five, and then 
nitrogen would have a full shell like helium, or nitrogen could gain one, two, three, and then it will have a full shell like neon. So um, an element is always going to do uh, the path of least resistance. It's always going to do the fewer, the smallest number. So in this case, nitrogen would rather gain three more electrons and look like neon than lose five. It's easier to gain three then lose five. Same with lithium. Lithium has one right now. Technically it could gain seven to look like neon, right? It's right here. It could go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And lithium could gain seven electrons and then it would have a full shell like neon. Well, it's much easier for lithium rather than gaining seven, it's much easier to just lose one and then it would have a positive charge, a plus one, instead of a minus seven. Same here, beryllium could gain six and it could have a minus six charge, or it could have a plus two charge if it just loses two. So it's easier for beryllium to lose two electrons and go backwards than it is for beryllium to gain six electrons and go forwards. So right here at the halfway point, this is when everything uh, it's easier, it becomes easier to gain electrons than it does to lose them. So everything before this column is positive. We see all of the elements over here are all positive elements. And every time an element that's over on this side turns into an ion, it's always going to be a positive ion. It's always going to lose electrons because all of the elements on this side of the table, it's easier for them to lose electrons to gain a full shell than it is to, to get more electrons to get a full shell. Only the electrons over on this side, or excuse me, only the elements on this side of the table will gain electrons to become anions to get full shells. So you have to be in this column or ahead in order to have uh, passed that halfway point where it's easier to gain than it is to lose. So, um, this this diagonal uh, column right here kind of represents the metalloids and all of the elements that are to the right of this diagonal line are nonmetals and they will all become anions they'll gain electrons and all of the elements to the left of this line are metals and they'll always lose electrons to become cations so that's how to make sense of this table we can predict the charges on the elements here. These will all gain three, because phosphorus will get one, two, three, and become argon. Uh, or it will have a full shell of electrons like argon. As will get one, two, three, and then it will get a full shell of electrons, and it will look, uh, and it will uh, have similar stability to krypton. Um, oxygen here could get two. Sulfur gets two. Selenium gets two, tellurium gets two. These all get one, so they all have a minus one charge. So that's how to make sense of uh, the main group elements here. So the transition elements here from three, row three, column three to column 12, these elements um, have variable charges, and you see that they've got, sometimes they have more than one charge. Chromium can have a plus three or a plus six, or it can have a plus four. So um, elements that are in the transition block here don't follow the same pattern that the elements in the main block do. Remember the main group is one, two, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. So these in, in the main group are predictable and they follow a pattern. But those in the transition group, um, although they're following a pattern, it's much more, it's, it's not as obvious as the pattern that the main group elements are following. Polyatomic ions are um, ions that have more than one atom. So far we've just looked at monatomic ions, which means that they're ions that come from one atom. So all of the ions that are on this table are monatomic, which means there's just one atom at a time. But sometimes ions have more than one atom. So um, here's an example of a chemical formula of a polyatomic ion. There's a magnesium atom. This um, magnesium is the metal, 
And so we know this is an ion because it goes metal, non-metal, and nitrogen and oxygen are both non-metals. So this is an ionic compound. Um, the magnesium is a cation, and the NO3, the uh, nitro group, nitrate group here, is an anion. So the way that we can um, look, interpret this chemical formula to see that NO3 is um, grouped together as an ion is because it comes in parentheses like this. So uh, anytime you see a group in a chemical formula um, in an ionic compound that's in parentheses, that indicates that that is a polyatomic ion. And generally, it's an anion. There are a couple of polyatomic cations, but usually uh, polyatomic ions are going to be anions. So in this case, um, we would, if we saw this compound, we would know that this was an ionic compound first because of the metal in front. Um, anytime there's a metal as the first element, that indicates it's ionic. And now it's an also important to see uh, how many of each atom there are, what, how we interpret these parentheses, how we do the math to see what happens with these subscripts. So an NO3 group has one nitrogen and three oxygens. These parentheses are showing us that, that, that all of those atoms stay together as a group. And then the two on the outside of the parentheses is showing us that there are two of these NO3 groups. So if every NO3 group has one N and three O's, then if I have two of them, I have two N's and six O's. So just like um, if these numbers were in a mathematical equation, I treat them the same way. So I'll uh, distribute the two into the parentheses and I'll multiply two times three here to get six oxygens and two times one, the subscript of nitrogen, to get two nitrogen atoms. And there's uh, a one, there's no subscript here, so we would assume that there's one. So then I have one magnesium atom. So here's the formulas of some common polyatomic ions. One way that we can, another way we can tell that these, uh, these elements stick together as a group is because they're non-metals. They're both of the elements that are in these polyatomic ions are non-metals, or sometimes all three of the elements if there's more than two. So um, when we look at a, um, an ionic compound, there's always a metal in there, and the metal always comes first. And if there's going to be a polyatomic ion in a chemical formula, then it's always a group of non-metal atoms. Nitrogen and hydrogen, both non-metals. Hydrogen and oxygen, both non-metals. Um, sulfur and oxygen, both non-metals. So uh, com um, polyatomic ions are always, uh, are always made of non-metal elements. So most of these don't follow any particular naming scheme. They're just kind of uh, have common names. And so if you're trying to name a compound that has a polyatomic ion with this formula, usually the best way to do it is to look up these formulas on a table, just like this one, so that you can see what the name, um, the name of the anion is to help you name the compound. Um, but some of these anions do follow a, a systematic naming, system, uh, naming scheme. For example, this set of um, Cl these chlorine and oxygen polyatomic ions here. We can see there's a set of four. ClO4 minus, ClO3 minus, ClO2 minus, and ClO1 minus. So um, when I have just a, whenever I have a set of polyatomic ions that have the same element, and the only thing that makes them different is the number of oxygens, then they're going to have very similar names. And they're always going to have the same root in this case, that root is C-H-L-O-R, chlor. So you can see that root in all four of these names on the left, perchlorate, chlorate, 
chlorite and hypochlorite. So um, let's take a look at those suffixes first, A-T-E and I-T-E, eight and ite. Uh, the eight suffix is um, given to the polyatomic ion that has more oxygens. When we only have a group of two, then they will be eight and ite. The eight would have more oxygens, and the root name with the I-T-E ending, the ite, would have fewer oxygens. In this case, since we have four in the group, um, four different compounds that all, all share the same common element with oxygen, then we have um, an I-T-E and an A-T-E suffix. We can see that on all four of these names. But then we have also a prefix. We have um, chlorite and hypochlorite and chlorate and perchlorate, this suffix that, or this prefix that goes before. So that's um, whenever we have just a grouping of two, we can go back here and look at um, NO3 minus and NO2 minus up here in the corner. That's nitrate and nitrite. So this follows the same, um, the same naming system. The one that has more oxygens is the ATE ion, and the one that has fewer oxygens is the ITE ion. And in this case that we just talked about with chlorine, if there's even more than two, if there's four, for example, then we have to introduce those prefixes as well, hypo and per. Ionic compounds are typically solids that have high melting and boiling points. So sodium chloride, for example, doesn't melt until about 800 degrees Celsius, whereas you know ice melts at zero degrees Celsius. So uh, ionic compounds generally have melting points that are much, much higher than molecular compounds like H2O, like water. Um, ionic compounds are non-conductive when they're solid, even though they, they contain pluses and minuses, they have charges in there. They still can't conduct electrons when they're solid because all of the particles are stuck, but they do conduct when they're molten. If you can turn an ion into a liquid by melting it, then those charges can move, the pluses and minuses can move, and then they can uh, conduct electrons, which is just a negative charge across, um, across the sample uh, because the positive charges are capable of moving at that point. So here is a visual depiction of that experiment. Um, down here you can see the solid salt essentially sodium chloride is just table salt and there's these two wires that are sticking in there and the two wires um, when placed into the salt don't conduct electricity so the light bulb doesn't turn on but if we turn on this um, furnace and melt the salt and it melts at 801 degrees Celsius then once we have molten salt and we dip the electrodes into the salt, then they, the light bulb turns on because at that point the liquid sodium chloride is capable of conducting electricity. So ion, the formulas of ionic compounds, in order to um, turn the name of a compound into a formula, um, we have to remember that they're electrically neutral. So sodium chloride, for example, has one plus and one minus, and the plus and the minus cancel out, so there's no charge on the compound overall. And that's always true with ionic compounds. They can never have a charge after we add up all the pluses and all the minuses. They have to equal zero. So um, if we are trying to make a compound out of aluminum, Al3+, plus, and oxide, O2-, minus, then we can't just have one of each, because then I'd have three plus and two minus, and I have a one plus left over when I added those together. So they actually form a compound Al2O3. So I need two aluminums and three oxygens. And the reason that they pair up in that specific ratio is because when I have two aluminums, then I have six plus. And when I have three oxygens, then three times two minus is six minus. So I just multiply the subscript, how many aluminums I have, by the charge. And um, when I have six positive charges and six negative charges, they cancel out to equal zero. And I am left with a neutral compound.
So one trick that we can use to generate um, an ionic formula from the ions themselves, if we're trying to, if we're given the word aluminum oxide, and we're trying to write the compound for aluminum oxide, the way that we would do that is by finding um, the aluminum ion on our periodic table that shows the charges. So aluminum is three plus, and then I would see oxide, oxygen makes an um, an anion with a two minus charge. So aluminum oxide would give me these two, um, I could find these two ions on the periodic table for aluminum and oxygen. And then to generate the compound, the ionic compound that they would form together, where their pluses and minuses are equal, I can just find the lowest common denominator, which is essentially what we did in the last problem. In this case it's six, 3 plus 3 is 6, 2 plus 2 plus 2 is 6, and so if I can make these both equal 6, then um, we can cancel them out. But a trick that almost always works is to use the charge of one ion and turn it into the subscript of the other ion, and use the charge of the anion and turn it into the subscript for the cation. The, the, the old switcheroo. So Al the three, the charge from aluminum becomes the subscript for oxygen, and the charge for oxygen becomes a subscript for aluminum. This uh, switching the charges like this is a, is a kind of a shortcut that does essentially the same thing of finding the lowest common denominator. So the only time that that doesn't work is when you have a compound like this over here. Um, when you have magnesium with two plus and oxygen with two minus, using this trick, the old switcheroo, would imply that I would make a formula Mg2O2. But that's not right because Mg has a charge of two plus and oxygen has a charge of two minus. They're already matched. I just need one magnesium and one oxygen to go together in order to make a compound. I don't need two of them. So this is redundant. And if I can um, reduce the subscripts in a chemical formula uh, by dividing by the same number, dividing by two in this case, then um, I should always use the simpler version of that chemical formula. So Mg2O2 is not the correct formula. It should be Mg1O1 because when I have one of those, one each of those ions, they're already matched. So ionic compounds um, can have polyatomic ions um, as cations or anions, um, sometimes both or neither. Um, and the way that you recognize these polyatomic ions is by searching for those parentheses. Um, Although sometimes when we're looking at a formula, depending on how many polyatomic ions there are in that compound, there may not be parentheses around it. So another way that you can search for a polyatomic ion is if the formula that you're looking at at this point, we're only going to see compounds that have two elements in them, like sodium chloride, or we might see elements that have three or four elements in them. But anytime we see a compound that has three or four elements in it, it's always going to contain a polyatomic ion. So if we look at this one down here, for example, let's count the elements. Calcium, phosphorus, and oxygen. I have three elements in this compound. Um, anytime I have more than two elements in a compound, at this point in our studies, it's always going to contain a polyatomic ion. So you should search for that, that formula for two elements that are non-metals because they're going to be stuck together as a polyatomic ion. So that's not going to be true later when we see parentheses or if we see more elements in a chemical formula when we start to look at organic compounds, um, then those same rules don't apply. But at this point, we're either going to see compounds that have two elements or compounds that have maybe three or four, and those compounds will always contain a polyatomic. Okay, so finally, um, when we're 
uh, looking at molecular compounds. We've been talking a lot about ionic compounds, um, but there's another class of compounds, those that are made from nonmetals. So when two elements uh, s steal electrons from each other, or one steals electrons and the other gives the electrons away, then that creates an ionic bond, as we've already seen. But another way that elements can come together is to share electrons. And if they share electrons, then that kind of bond is called a covalent bond. And the resulting compound is called a molecular compound or a covalent compound. So these molecular compounds are created by two nonmetals. So here's an example. A chlorine atom and a chlorine atom can come together to make uh, a chlorine molecule. This electron, this orange electron here, and this orange electron here are shared, so the chlorine um, atoms can each access each other's electron, and that creates a bond between them, so they get stuck together. And here's what I mean by this. And when we were looking uh, at the sodium and the chloride example before, they each need to get eight electrons. Well, I can't, this chlorine can't give this chlorine its electron because if it did, if this electron went over here, then this one would have eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and the new one it would get, eight. But then this one would only have six because this one would be gone and it would only have six left over. So giving this electron to this chlorine atom solves the problem for this guy. He has eight now but it doesn't solve a problem for this one. So that, that transaction doesn't work. So rather, if this one is allowed to use this electron, then this one will have eight, because he already has seven. He just needs to borrow this one, and then he'll have eight. And this one say, is in the same situation. He already has seven. He just needs to borrow this one, and then he'll have eight too. So when they come together, and they get really close together like this, then those electrons kind of belong to both atoms at that point. They're sharing electrons. So this happens when both atoms are non-metals. If there is a metal, then the metal is going to give its electron away and an ion will be formed. But if they are both non-metals, then ions are not formed and the electrons are shared and I make a molecule instead. So here's, how, here's the difference. Nonmetals both have a lot of electrons. Um, a metal doesn't have a lot of electrons. A metal only has one electron, for example. It's easy for the metal to give one electron away. It gives one electron away, and now it's empty, which means it has a full shell underneath. So giving one electron away is a good option for a metal. It only has one in the first place. But giving electrons away is not a good option for a nonmetal. It has too many electrons to give them away. Nonmetals want to take electrons. That's what they do down here. This nonmetal takes this electron. So these nonmetals up here, they want to take electrons, not give them away. But we already went over that. This guy can't take this one's electron because then it will only have six, and they can't, they won't both be happy. So whenever I have two nonmetals, they share, and this gives them both eight because I get to count the electrons in the middle twice. Two four, six, eight. So this one has an octet. Two, four, six, eight. So this one has an octet. And down here, two, four, six, eight. This one has an octet. And this one, remember, it has eight electrons underneath the one it just gave away. So two, four, six, eight. This one has an octet. So when the two elements are paired correctly and they're making the right kind of bond, then all of the elements get octets. That's why sometimes elements come together to make a covalent bond, because that will give them eight electrons each. And sometimes elements come together to make an ionic bond, because that will give them eight electrons each. And the way that we can tell is by looking at metal plus nonmetal, ionic bond. Nonmetal plus nonmetal is a covalent bond.